The deep blue sea is as mysterious and powerful as outer space, and perhaps in its own way even more mysterious. Science might be able to pinpoint how life began with the Big Bang Theory, but have researchers come close to figuring out the true depth of the sea? And we're not just talking the distance from the bottom of the sea to the surface, there's much more to the ocean than meets the eye. Perhaps that's why we're all so fascinated by it. If you were curious, look no further. This is the deepest part of the ocean. Life support, good. Depth, one, zero, nine, or two, eight meters. The Mariana Trench. Since we're getting deep, between Hawaii and the Philippines, close to the island of Guam, sits the Mariana Trench. Ever heard of it? We're talking about the deepest spot in the entire ocean. This crescent-shaped impression at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean has a maximum depth of almost seven miles. Toward the southern end of the legendary trench is the Challenger Deep, the point most distant from the water's surface and the deepest part of the trench. It sits 36,070 feet below sea level. To give you some perspective on just how deep we're talking, if you were to put the entire Mount Everest at the bottom, its peak would still sit around 7,000 feet below sea level. Deep with a capital D, at this extreme depth, the Mariana Trench is immersed in complete darkness and the temperature is close to freezing. And on the fact that the water pressure is 8 tons per square inch, extremely deep and very real. The Mariana Trench is part of a global network of deep throughs that cut across the ocean floor, formed when two tectonic plates collide. One of the plates dives beneath the other at the collision point and grinds deeper into the Earth's mantle. That's how an ocean trench is born. Hey, hey, did you know that if you smash the like button, subscribe and click the notification bell, you're more likely to win the lottery? So what are you waiting for? Super Cameo Candy Facility, Japan. Before a star starts to collapse, it shoots out neutrinos, a subatomic particle that's very similar to an electron, but has no electrical charge and a very small mass, one of the most abundant particles in the entire universe. They're moving through you right now. The Super Cameo Candy Facility is a neutrino observatory hidden 3,281 feet beneath a mountain in the Japanese city of Haida. The observatory was designed to detect high-energy neutrinos to search for proton decay and to study solar and atmospheric activity that will ultimately uncover the origins of life. The Super K acts as a sort of early warning system for these monumental cosmic events. However, they're incredibly difficult to detect. Engineers must go to significant lengths to build these sort of facilities. The facility must be buried beneath a mountain or submerged in a lake to isolate the experiment from cosmic rays. But ultimately, neutrino detectors, like the Super Cameo Candy Facility, makes for some of the most unbelievably technologically advanced science we've ever seen. The detector itself takes the form of an enormous steel tank measuring 135.8 feet tall, 128.9 feet across, and holding 50,000 tons of ultra-pure water. This water is so pure, it can melt metal. <laughs> Motuo, Tibet. According to the Tibetan Buddhist scripture, Motuo, or Hidden Lotus in Tibetan, is Tibet's purest and holiest region. As the most remote county in the southeastern part of the country, Motuo is located on the southern slope of the Himalayas, covering an area of seven and a half million acres. As one-tenth of China's plant species can be found here, it's been dubbed the Natural Museum of Tibet. It's a thriving botanical wonder standing over 3,000 feet above sea level. Although it's hard to imagine that one can enjoy tropical fruits such as bananas and pineapples in the snow-capped mountains, this is really the case in Motuo. Motuo boasts a typical subtropical moist climate, which brings plenty of rainfall and spring-like days all year round. So it's no wonder living is good here. It's the only county in Tibet with no highway link to the outside world, and it's the last county where the Brahmaputra River crosses over in China before it flows to India. As a result, most of the locals are descendants of people who migrated from other places in Tibet more than 100 years ago. The mysterious Motuo County is mainly inhabited by the Minba and Luoba people with a population of about 10,000. <laughs> The Desolation Islands, located in the southern Indian Ocean of the eastern coast of Africa and just north of Antarctica, 
The Kerguelen Islands have earned the nickname Desolation Islands due to their remote location. It's seriously remote, located 2,051 miles away from any sort of civilization. Massive active glaciers cover the main island, which stretches nearly 100 miles long. The Cook Ice Cap, the largest glacier with an area of about 156 square miles, lies on the west-central part of the island. The highest point is Mount Ross which rises along the southern coast of the island and has an elevation of 6,070 feet. The main island is surrounded by almost 300 lonely satellite islands, and the mighty sea that surrounds them is teeming with life. Home to one of the biggest maritime nature reserves on the planet, most other landscapes around the world have been shaped and changed by mankind, but these sub-Antarctic islands boast original underwater landscapes that feature a very unique ecosystem. There are no native inhabitants of the island, but as part of the French Southern and Antarctic lands is a permanently occupied by 50 to 100 French scientists, engineers, and researchers at any given time of the year. <laughs> Santa Cruz del Islote, a population of about 1,200 live on an island the size of two football fields in the middle of the Caribbean, making Santa Cruz del Islote one of the most densely populated islands on the planet. It's an artificial island located off the coast of Colombia and a part of the archipelago of San Bernardo. It's just a two-hour journey southwest of Cartagena. Though it's only 2.4 acres in size, it's home to over a whopping 1,200 people. That's four times as dense as Manhattan. The island was uninhabited until 150 years ago. However, the fishermen who used it for shelter during storms started building houses there and having families. A small community was born. Water is mainly gathered from rainfall. There's plenty of seafood for the inhabitants to eat, but just one generator that runs for a few hours a day, with the only other power coming from solar panels. And the citizens love Santa Cruz's community spirit and spend their time playing games, dancing, making music, swimming, with most of the daily life taking place in the alleys between the houses. And with the new programs for recycling, waste management, and environmental care in the works, it's a vibrant community that takes care of its own. <laughs> McMurdo Station, Antarctica. This U.S. research and support facility was established in 1955 at the southernmost point of Antarctica. Only accessible by ship, the region was first discovered by James Clark Ross in 1840. McMurdo Station is the gateway of most scientific, private, and touristic journeys into the Antarctic built on solid land at the edge of McMurdo Sound. The facility shares the island with Mount Erebus, a 12,448-foot active volcano and the inactive volcano Mount Terror. And just a stone's throw away from the modern-day McMurdo lies the spot on Hut Point marked by the famous hut which was left stocked with provisions in 1904 by icon Robert F. Scott on his polar expedition. McMurdo Station started as an encampment as part of a major series of American expeditions to Antarctica called Operation Deep Freeze. Initially, the station was simply a collection of tents. One thing is for certain, individuals who choose to call McMurdo home, even for part of the career, can be as unusual as the climate at their doorstep. During the interminably sunny summer months, McMurdo's population booms to over a thousand. Grocers procure international comfort food, carpenters and construction workers maintain the place, bus drivers transport passengers and goods via the infamous Ivan the Terra Bus. <laughs> The Movile Cave the Movil Cave. In 1986, workers in Romania were testing the ground to see if it was suitable for a power plant when they stumbled across something almost out of this world, the Movil Cave, just a few miles west from the Black Sea. This natural wonder was sealed up for around five and a half million years. Although the air is poisonous and unbearably humid, the inhabitants of the Movil Cave are like no other, a gold mine for biologists. The caves are crawling with life, an incredible 48 species, including 33 found nowhere else in the world. Most of the creatures in the cave have no vision and lack pigment, the extra long limbs and antenna that help them navigate their environment. But how do they survive in a dark cave full of poisonous gases? Once in the depths of the cave, the air contains half of the amount of oxygen than usual and is high in carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. Yet all of the species play a distinct role within the cave's ecosystem cut off from the rest of the world. To explore the rest of the cave, you must navigate dangerous underwater passageways. It's impossible to forget you're very far from the surface getting lost or worse, stuck in this maze of tunnels would be deadly. <laughs> the Williamson Tunnels, England 
The Williamson Tunnels are a series of labyrinth-like subterranean excavations in the Edge Hill area of Liverpool, thought to have been created by tobacco merchant, landowner, and philanthropist Joseph Williamson between 1810 and 1840. To carry out the work, he recruited a large pool of labor from among the less fortunate of the area, including soldiers left unemployed at the end of the Napoleonic War. And it's still unclear what his real motive was in building these impressive tunnels. However, following his death in 1840, the tunnel project halted and they fell into disrepair. And as buildings in Liverpool were demolished, rubble was stuffed in the Williamson tunnels by the city. They remained largely inaccessible until archaeological investigations were carried out in 1995. Since then, volunteers have rediscovered and excavated an extensive network of tunnels, chambers, and voids across several sites with sections open to the public. The tunnels range in size from a huge hall, 70 feet long, 25 feet wide with 20-foot ceilings, to a narrow passage 4 feet wide and 6 feet high. It's still unknown how many tunnels there are and how far they reach. <laughs> Wakakina Oasis, Peru Welcome to South America's most popular oasis in the heart of the Ica Desert, known as the Oasis of America. It's a lush island in the Sea of Sand, completely in contrast with the extremely harsh environment surrounding it. Situated 186 miles from the capital of Lima and on the very edge of the Atacama Desert, the town of Wakakina was settled in the 1940s when Peru's financial elite built holiday homes to take advantage of the oasis's reported healing properties. After a revival again in the 90s, with the rise of ecotourism, the extra small city is a hotbed for backpacking, dune buggy rides, and sandboarding. Wakakina is packed with restaurants and hotels framed by palm trees lunging out of the sand. This Peruvian watering hole in the middle of nowhere has been a tourist hotspot for 70 plus years. The legend behind the oasis involves a hunter and a beautiful Incan princess. One day she was walking in the sand dunes, admiring herself in a mirror. The hunter noticed her and soon her eyes caught his curious gaze and she dropped the mirror. The shards in the glass became a tiny pool in the desert, consuming the princess and turning her into a mermaid. It's said she still lives in the lagoon, occasionally making appearances to sing for tourists on moonlit nights. Longyearbyen, Norway Svalbard is a small Norwegian archipelago that sits about halfway between Norway and the North Pole. Longyearbyen is the only self-governing municipality in Svalbard. Could you imagine living there? It's the world's northernmost town. During the 400 years after its discovery, Svalbard was an Arctic whaling and hunting mecca. However, today, most wildlife is protected by law. By the 20th century, coal mining began in the region. That's how Longyearbyen, meaning Longyear City, got its name. After John M. Longyear began mining operations there in 1906, and by the time the 1980s arrived, nearly 15 years after the opening of Longyearbyen's airport, tourism flourished. Today, tourists visit here year-round, and it's popular for wilderness treks and ecotourism. While anyone can move there and work, no visa is required, it's not an easy place to live, as you can see. There are 24 hours of complete darkness per day from mid-November to late January. Temperatures range from 6.8 degrees Fahrenheit in winter to 42.8 degrees Fahrenheit in summer, and polar bears outnumber humans. <laughs> Omyakon, Siberia Speaking of cold, it gets well below zero in Omyakon, Siberia, long known as the coldest inhabited place on Earth. The lowest recorded temperature here is a mind-bending minus 96.16 degrees Fahrenheit back in 1924. It's just a few hundred miles from the Arctic Circle. This village of 500 residents tucked away in a remote corner of the world is so nasty cold that planes can't land during the winter, and it takes two days to arrive by car from the nearest major city, a mere 576 miles away. The frozen ground makes it difficult for working indoor plumbing, so most toilets are outhouses. The bitter cold also makes it difficult to dig graves. The ground has to be warmed with a bonfire before a funeral. Locals use heated garages for their cars because cars left outside need to be kept running or else they'll not restart. And of course the risk of frostbite is constant if any skin is exposed to that kind of cold. Even wearing glasses outdoors can cause them to stick to your face. Surprisingly, although their winters are long and extremely cold, summers are mild to warm, sometimes even hot, with cool to cold summer nights. The warmest month on record was July 2010 with an average temperature of 65.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Not quite beach weather, but hey, it's a start. La Rinconada, Peru 
Nestled high up in the remote Peruvian Andes, you'll find this tiny town about three miles up. La Rinconada is home to 50,000 people and sits at an elevation of 16,728 feet above sea level. That's just 3,000 feet shy of the peak of Tanzania's Mount Kilimanjaro. At this height, it's the highest town in the world. The town, once only a temporary settlement, has quickly grown in recent years. From 2001 to 2009, the town's population grew by an astonishing 230%. Why? Gold is the main resource the city has. In fact, the famous gold mine is the only reason anyone even moves here. The environment is barren with little more than snow-capped mountain peaks surrounding the town. The town has rainy summers and dry winters with a large variation seeing cool to cold days and freezing nighttime temperatures throughout the year, with snowfalls common. But the trek to the top is an unfortunate experience. Just make sure to properly plan ahead when organizing your trip. La Rinconada is accessible only by truck, the several-day journey made via treacherous winding mountain roads. And keep in mind that once you arrive, the town lacks basic amenities due to its isolated location. There's no running water, no paved roads, and for the most part, no electricity. But maybe you'll strike it rich. Hmm. <laughs> Karen Island, South Pacific. The least populated territory in the world is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, more than 3,000 miles from anywhere. This volcanic island is not much larger than Manhattan's Central Park. Welcome to Pitcairn Island. The presence of stone tools, burial sites, petroglyphs, and other artifacts indicates that Pitcairn Island had been inhabited before its discovery by European explorers. Back in 1789, British sailors mutinied on the HMS Bounty and settled on Pitcairn Island. They were able to start a community, and in 1838, the Pitcairn Islands officially became a British territory. Today, all of its residents are descendants of those same people. Can you fathom what life would be like out there in those days? Ships began visiting occasionally from Britain bearing books and other supplies, the population grew, and the island's limited natural resources increasingly became a source of concern. Leaders of the community proposed mass immigration to Tahiti or to Australia, but after the islanders had been resettled on Tahiti, many grew dissatisfied and returned to Pitcairn. Thereafter, the island became a port of call for whalers and passenger ships steaming between the United States and Australia. Tristan de Cunha Island Trista de Cunha Island is a part of a group of islands in the South Atlantic Ocean, approximately 1,732 miles off the coast of Cape Town, midway between Southern Africa and South America, the largest and northernmost of the group. It has a coastline of 21 miles. The island group was discovered in 1506 by a Portuguese admiral. Two unsuccessful attempts to settle the island during the 17th century and one in 1810 preceded the stationing of British representatives in 1816 when the island group was formally annexed by the United Kingdom. When they were withdrawn in 1817, three of its members chose to stay, and over the years they were joined by shipwrecked sailors, settlers of European extraction, and women from St. Helena. By 1886, there were almost 100 inhabitants. Recently, it was announced that the 265,348 square miles of the waters surrounding the islands will become a marine protection zone. The move will make the zone the largest no-take zone in the Atlantic and the fourth largest on the planet. A no-take zone is an area set aside by the government where no extractive activity is allowed, including fishing, hunting, logging, mining, and drilling. Socotra Island, Yemen. In Arabic, it's known as the blood of the two brothers. The unique tree, with its crimson resin and crown of prehistoric leaves, is a beloved symbol of Socotra Island and its parent country of Yemen. Legend has it that the otherworldly dragon's blood tree first grew on the spot where two brothers, Darsa and Sama, fought to the death. It's an amazing place. Once at the heart of the ancient silk and spice trading routes between the Arab world, Africa and Asia, today the island lies in the middle of one of the world's most important oil trading channels. The so-called Galapagos of the Indian Ocean, Socotra's 60,000 inhabitants have lived in harmony with nature for thousands of years, almost completely isolated from the outside world. Of the 800-plus plant species found on Socotra today, 37% are endemic, meaning they live nowhere else. The islands play host to as many as 11 unique bird species, and over 90% of reptiles and mollusks are endemic too. Offshore, multiple biogeographical areas converge around Socotra, creating an equally diverse and rich marine environment. No wonder that, in eras gone by, Greek and Arab sailors connected this peculiar and plentiful land with paradise. Some even regarded Socotra as part of the lost mythical continent of Atlantis. Mm -hmm.